<laughs> it's, it's, I'm filming it. So. <laughs> what happens then that we felt the power that we actually can control nature. So suddenly, we were forcing nature into a relationship nature didn't want to get into. And <laughs> They're just transformed. They're, they're, that's amazing. <laughs> it's just amazing. And that is one of these little things you can do, you know, just keep your farm open. I think it's just the opposite of what's uh, no trespassing. Yeah. You just say, well, welcome, yeah. you know, yeah. except government stay out. <laughs> <laughs> It's the attitude regarding the money that it's you don't do it because of the money and the blessings are there when you when you do it right and I always found that when you do it right out of the inner intention it's fine but it also brings opens up a really interesting question and that is the social responsibility of biodynamic farming and and I think that we, we haven't really talked about that but there is a there was an indication uh, given by Steiner Years and years ago, I know, <laughs> 24 years, uh, 20, uh, 1924, and he talked about that we need to create cultural islands in the industrial desert, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. And for the longest, I always talked, I always thought, well, you know, it's the pork plant or the Chrysler plant and, you know, all these <laughs> manufacturing things. And then in the last few years, I realized we actually are literally in an industrial desert because everything is industrial farming. Yeah. It's, a, it's a green desert where, where there's no room for the human being. Mm -hmm. yeah. That we understand, okay, let's put aside the government for the moment, let's put aside any kind of health claims or safety claims, that we can ourselves uh, say that we are acting in good faith with due diligence and I I wrote about uh, 10 months no 12 months ago I wrote an article in uh, on the bovine um, are we destroying our own uh, raw milk ruling in Ontario and the reason was that there are jump that there is cow share cow share operations jumping up uh, everywhere and some of them operate really great and some of them operating don't know what they're doing not because they don't want to know but because they just don't have the experience okay all of the cattle in the current herd are from those genetics there's no outside genetics and yet i learned in school when you intermarry in europe and you're a prince or a princess you know you, you get genetic problems yet his cows aren't getting genetic problems and when I talked to him about this and I already knew why but Michael said well yeah I knew it wouldn't be possible without nutrition and in order to have nutrition for cattle they're closer to the soil than we are but we're only a step away so that uh, making sure the cows are healthy is not dependent on what they eat so much as it's dependent on the soil fertility that creates what they eat and cattle know that, even if human beings don't.
Good morning. Good morning to you again. Did you have a good sleep? Yes, and Blaine loves her hat. Oh, <laughs> good sleep. And, and uh, you, but you weren't here this morning. We were here at 9.30. Uh, so okay. we were here so you, all the morning. Yeah. So you've heard all the oh, testimony yeah. this morning. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. what they told me. So that's we get lunch? Five minutes. Oh, five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> not quite lunch. Soon, but not quite. Are you getting hungry? What And I think one term which Steiner used when his agricultural lecture, um, which was for me actually a very significant uh, aspect of farming, and that was the individuality of a farm, which comes out so perfectly in these in, in these in our stories and our biography. And I was talked about there's a bi there's an individual biography and there's a farm biography. So there's an individual karma and there's also farm karma and. It is so interesting to watch, you know, these these uh, farmers here. I, I didn't want to say young farmers, but <laughs> <laughs> I, let's say young farmers, young young farmers in the sense of the approach that uh, how they have taken, uh, how they they try to look new at, at how to pursue farming, and I would I would add to what what they all said. I would add if there wouldn't be biodynamic farming, I wouldn't farm. Bottom line, I wouldn't farm because it wouldn't make sense for me. Uh, because I, I would not find the satisfaction when you look at how farming is nowadays done. I couldn't do it. It would, for me, the rate of a living planet, and uh, it, it it needed to go far beyond that in order to sustain myself in wh what you call this uh, this rather hard challenge you face every day uh, and every year. And uh, there's this old saying: a farmer always gets one one year too late wise. Mm. So <laughs> he always knows better when the year is finished and then the new year starts. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, uh, what, what's also great, and I, I want to I want to stress that that the first time I spoke at the conference, the organic conference, <laughs> I think a third of this room wasn't even born. <laughs> when I look at that, and and the change which has happened uh, over these over these many years is quite remarkable. What I think is also remarkable is this increasing interest in the spiritual aspects of farming, because the satisfaction from an from an organic point of view is rather limited. It's necessary and important, but it is rather limited. Um, what what. What Uli described, um, I think it's just a pattern of life. You would, whatever you get thrown into it, you are thrown into it for a reason. It is not, um, it, you get the challenges thrown to you which you can actually master. Uh, I'm a great believer in that unless you're strong enough, you will not face them. It's not here to break, it's here to, to make you stronger and to move ahead. Um, when I started farming 30, 30, 37 years ago, 37 years ago, I got into my in, into the apprenticeship program. Um, it was I was faced with with a real hard dilemma, and that was that my heart was very much uh, focused towards music, and the other heart was this deep, deep connection to the earth. And that started started with uh, w with a great teacher. I was a Waldorf school um, uh, kid, and uh, we had gardening. We had gardening with our teacher. And, and as you you know, when you when you're in grade five or six, you know, and then you have to weed these endless rows of carrots <laughs> and so on. So the boys, you know, always did something, so we took a little bit of dirt and put it in a little pebbles and threw it at the girls, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> and the, the, the gardening teacher saw that, and he was feared because he can be so aggressive 
you know, in, in his approach, and we watched it. He was never really aggressive towards the students, but what happened was he saw that, and he got, he got so, so mad at us, and then said, you have to stay. You have to stay after everybody's gone, and I will talk to you. And we were just trembling. We didn't, we didn't know what to expect. So all the other students left, and we just looked at them and said, well, now that's the end of our life. <laughs> <laughs> and so then he changed completely around, and he became the, 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 most, the most loving person I have seen. And what he said, guys, come here, have a look at that. And he took, with an inner devotion, he took the soil in his hands, and I just see that, and he said, do you know what this is doing? What this is doing uh, for mankind? He said, "This is what grows our food." Mm -hmm. Okay, and he took it in his hand and said, "Look at that!" And he was throwing that around, mm -hmm. and that changed completely. That 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 is where I then got this this inner sense of the, the sacredness of this three four inches. We are. We are gu uh, guardians, or we are, uh, yeah, guardians of, of the fertility which, which basically nourishes mankind. Mm -hmm. And <coughs> so the roots were laid, this deep connection to the earth, and then this lofty music and the root rootness of, uh, of the earth was kind of literally tearing me apart. Um, and then uh, I just woke up with a dilemma one, one day, I think I was 17, and then it, it, there was a clarity, and I think that's what Uli was talking about, there was such a clarity, and I said, there will be thousands and thousands of great musicians in the future, mm -hmm. and there will be not many farmers left who love the earth. And so I decided to go the path of becoming a farmer, and it was so clear, it was wonderful, I went there, and uh, went through the apprenticeship program, and then after a while, I missed the music, and that's <laughs> where I then kind of started to combine these two things, and, and understood the value of balancing yourself with something which is more than, than so hard work. Where do we go from here? Because we can assume that 95%, wherever we go, the farms are depleted, uh, the soils are depleted, the, the uh, fertility is not there, and so how can, we, how can we expect then that we actually reach that level of nutrition uh, in, in our food? And what Gary was, I forgot that, but Gary, a really interesting point, and that is I, I converted now three farms, okay? Three farms, and every time the same thing, after five to seven years, we cut the food, not be, uh, because of us, but because the animals didn't need food, we cut that two-thirds, no, we cut that one-third to a half down. So instead of a thousand bales of hay in the winter to feed the cows in order to keep them in shape, we would need 600 bales or 500 bales. Same thing happens with children. Same thing with children. <laughs> so when people talk, yeah, and the interesting thing is, you know, when I go in the supermarket and see how these wagons loaded up, the wagons, you know, with fluff, yeah, and people tell me they can't afford organic food, and then I say, well, I, one thing I can guarantee you, when you change, you know, to quality food, your food bill goes down.